I guess my heart just completely stopped. I lay on the floor for maybe a minute. You know, from one moment to another, you're back alive. The realization that you went there and came back just changes your life forever. You have a family and you have a kid. It takes so much time to sort of get to grips with that idea that you could have lost all of that, you know. When I sort of got back into my groove and I was actually able to go in the same studio again and try and put all that aside and start making music again, it was pretty clear that I had to also musically go back to where I came from. The first couple of years of my life, I traveled around a lot. My dad was a professional soccer player, so every time he would go to a different club, the family would move along with him. But eventually we uh, settled in Eindhoven. Basically anyone that comes into Eindhoven sees the stadium as like the first sort of major landmark. It's like an anchor in the city, you know? When I grew up, I just remember that, you know, my dad wasn't home very often because, you know, he's always traveling and obviously very sort of absorbed by football and about his work. My dad showed me from a very early age that, you know, you don't have to sort of go to school and then work in office for the rest of your life. He'd have like a pretty sizable vinyl collection and um, he would always play music at the house, especially when he was playing matches on the weekend. He'd have kind of like a set list, I guess, of songs that would bring him in the right mindset to play the game. So he would hear a lot of records over and over again, basically. And that's really where the collecting thing started for me. The main record store in Eindhoven was called Bullet. As soon as I got like money to go on the bus and go to the city, I would go there and just browse all the, the racks. There was always like a, a sort of crew of people that worked there every day and uh, Robert was one of them. All still. Yeah? Yeah. This is it? Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah, you know, can do Yeah? Yeah, let him buy it. <laughs> and I have one room here. <laughs> when I started buying music from him, I obviously looked up to him because I was so much younger and he was very much in the know of what was going on, obviously. When I started making records, he was very supportive. You know, I always sort of run into him when I'm back home in the city, and it's nice to just have that support, you know, from someone I looked up to. I had some water damage when I was on holiday in Asia. My whole Jeff Mills collection is uh, fucked. <laughs> <laughs> That's over here. <coughs> Yeah, you can't get it out. Awful. Yeah, it's all it's all males and axes and uh, yeah, and here is all uh, Laurent Garnier F communication also fucked. <laughs> but yeah, your insurance was quite good, so thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> I always thought this this sound was amazing. The woo, woo, 
you know? And then um, I bought a synth, the Oberheim Matrix 1000, and like preset number five or something on the, it's exactly that sound. And when I heard that, I was like, oh no, you know? It's, you thought that it came from outer space, and then all of a sudden it was just a preset in the synth. I recognized it immediately as the, the sound of this record. Uh, next? Yeah. I think you introduced me to like loads of stuff, especially in the beginning, you know, before I even knew what I was looking for. Or maybe I would find like five things that I wanted to listen to, but then Robert gave me another five <laughs> of things that I might like. I'd sort of expanded my, my musical knowledge more yeah. and more. Horizon. And that's, yeah. I think that's kind of how you yeah. do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Most DJs want to, to just uh, go their own path and yeah. uh, look in certain kind of uh, style. Yeah. But you were always very open to uh, yeah, yeah. to different uh, kinds of things. Yeah. And I think that has shaped your musical upbringing in putting all the different styles together. Yeah. 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 Even to this day, he walks around town and people will just know who he is and what he means for the city, you know? It's like a, it's really like a bit of an icon, I think. He probably won't agree with that, but uh, that's how, how we see it. I really like that uh, the fact that uh, even when after you move to the States, mm -hmm. that uh, you accomplished so much in music and uh, you always uh, credited me for just a part of it uh, in the development of that. And I'm really proud, proud of that to be, yeah, a, yeah to be a, a part of your uh, musical uh, upbringing. So you are, yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Newest and most atomically potent techno, designed in space labs to be a mind-blowing experience, is already burning tracks in dance halls around the world. Though 69 was thoroughly trained in math and applied atomics, he is a content with his lifetime. He is content with his lifetime career as a condom tester. <laughs> what? <laughs> What's that? 1991. Let's go, Greg. Yes, yes. Condom tester. <laughs> okay. When I got into the clubbing thing, I left everything else behind pretty much and just went straight for anything electronic. And that was just like such a different spectrum almost of sound and of culture and the people were very different. I was already interested in a sort of broken styles like early metalhead stuff and we decided to just go to London and see what it was all about, you know, just to sort of see where this music lives. For sort of the music I was into, I think Metalheads was like the, the premier night where all the new music was presented, you know, someone who made music in the week and then cut it at Music House and then it goes straight to the Blue Note, play it there. So if you wanted to be in the know of what was happening in drum and bass at that time, then Blue Note was the, the spot. You never really knew who was going to play that night or who was going to show up and do their thing and what kind of music they would bring, you know? So that was like my excitement for waiting in the queue. It was like, who's gonna be there, you know? It's like, yeah, Scotty. And then, you know, he would walk up and be like, okay, this is gonna be amazing tonight, you know? People were there for the music. They weren't there for any other reason. They weren't there to be idiots. They weren't there to necessarily chat up girls, yeah. you know? I mean, I'm sure loads of fun stuff was happening all around it, but yeah. the main reason that people were there was they were just obsessed with the music. But for me, the trip was maybe 15 minutes. Right. For you, the trip was like a pilgrimage coming from a different country. We heard the music, obviously, or we heard like little bits of music of sort of early drum and bass, and you know, we were so intrigued by it because it was so different from everything else, and it sort of combined a lot of things that we liked. Like, you know, it's got break beats, it has like sci-fi, sort of sounds to it, it's got that innovation. Everybody went there after their weekends, all these producers really up in their game every single week and you get to hear it on a weekly basis. You could hear the progression. And also you've got to think because of dub plate culture back then, you were hearing a tune there, you definitely weren't getting it for about 12, 18 months. And there was no other way of hearing it, so you had to, you had to be there. 
that's like the highest compliment that you could pay a club night, really. Yeah. The idea that producers would actually make or cut tunes with that space in mind. Creating a space like that makes the music get better yeah. because the crowd don't suffer fools gladly. But at yeah. the same time, if you bring it, it's the yeah. best place to play in the world. Yeah. You know, music is sort of different levels. Like you have a bass level and you have a punch, like a body level, and you have like a sort of mind level, you know? Yeah. And I think you hear that when you're sort of standing in front of the speaker at, you know, at the blue note and you hear that music and, and yeah, you feel these three levels coming together, you know? And, that, that's definitely something that I still carry with me now, you know, every time I make music, that's how I think about it and that, that's how I experience it, so. Yeah. In London, I kind of understood what drum and bass was about in a sort of club setting and how the music should sound. For some sort of naive reason, we thought that we could sort of recreate that in our little city of Eindhoven. And that's kind of how I started putting on my own nights. <laughs> One of the club nights we did was called Red Zone, and it was like five people. We didn't know any DJs, so we were just the people that were gonna play all the music. That was my first DJ gig. Five people became 10 people, and then 10 became a couple hundred, and then from a couple hundred we went to a bigger club, which is about maybe 800 capacity. So the nights were running really well, and then one day I got a phone call in the morning, and uh, it was my mom, and she said my dad passed away. He was just uh, doing something really random, like vacuuming or something, and just collapsed and had a heart attack. He was only 56, but you know, you obviously have like just general health problems or whatever. But there was nothing that I would say showed that he was in any danger of, you know, dying. It was definitely a really hard time for the whole family. So this is, this is how it all... When he passed away, that was just all the more reason to really sort of pursue whatever I wanted to do with music. That was really the only way to, to deal with it, I think, you know, and to try and sort of come to grips with the idea of him not being there, you know? Sound has always had that hybrid element with it. Every time he goes somewhere, he's like record shopping. You can tell that he's just taking all those little bits of everything and it's his own sort of interpretation. And that makes the sort of Martin music. And you can hear that in every tune. When I make music, I always sort of keep all my parts and sort of recycle them and make them into new things. And it's not like every time I want to make a song, I just turn on all the equipment and start from scratch. I kind of like that because it always gives me that immediate familiarity that also makes all my music sound similar but different. When I started putting out my first records in 2005 and 2006, I also got into a relationship with my then girlfriend, but now wife, Ali. She's from the States and um, we started off sort of traveling back and forth as a, a long distance relationship. Come on, chef. Now. We came back from like a red zone night, I think, four in the morning. You know, we go to bed and I'm laying on his chest, falling asleep, and his heart was like beating very erratic. 
it obviously wasn't normal. And then I'm like, what's going on with your chest, you know? And then he's like, oh, that's how it's been. It just does that. So I'm like, maybe you need to go to the doctor and get it looked at. They dismissed it. You know, they said you had a cold, right? To eat chicken soup or something. And then a couple months went by and I was just, I wasn't having it. I was like, you really need to go. Cause I kept feeling that sort of irregular heart rhythm in his chest, you know? Then it turned out that I had a genetic heart defect. I remember I joked about, you know, this is why I like broken beats and not 4-4. Four, four. Mm. Good. Very good. I wasn't really aware of any um, problems until he just mentioned like, oh, I need to go to the hospital, I need to get this operation. It's something for my heart. I'm going to put something in my chest and I'm just like, are you getting a pacemaker or something? It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. That's nothing big, you know, we're just going to do that because I have this heart thing. And I was just like, what? Like, that's pretty, that's pretty big. But he was like, no, no, it's going to be fine. It was a pretty harsh kind of surgery. I sort of thought about sort of my own life and death quite a bit then. I was like, okay, you know, this is going to help me out if, God forbid, that would ever happen. In the beginning, it was very hard to kind of get used to knowing he had this condition and him traveling and doing his gigs, lack of sleep. And I mean, that he'd travel and stay up for like two days, you know, just because he had to. And I put a lot of pressure on myself with worries and all that, but his doctor never said like, stop your gigs. That was that, you know, that was for me, something that would just be there and you know, I got over it pretty quickly and sort of continued doing whatever I was doing. Given that, you know, you have to be sort of healthy and try and sort of be as, as nice to your body as you can. I'll only go to the beginning and then I fly back tomorrow. Oh, yeah. So I'll just go a little bit early and then... Oh, yeah. Steffi's opening at 12. Oh, okay. so, oh, yeah. yeah. Not a panorama bar. Yeah, yeah. Ah, panorama bar. So, yeah. Cool, yeah. So yeah. I'll just go there a little bit and then... Yeah, head back home. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll go. I'll Try and get some sleep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, all right, man. Cool. Good to see you as always. Me and Martin, we met like in a van that was taking us from the airport to the Lowlands Festival, which is like a big pop festival in Holland. And we were both playing. Yeah, making, uh, making jungle. We started chatting and then found out we were born maybe yeah. like a 10 minutes car drive distance apart. Mm -hmm. And we just yeah. chatted for two hours, straight up, you know, where were you, what did you do? And then found out like, oh, you were born in Eindhoven, oh, yeah, I went to that club, oh, I went to that party, you know. And the interesting thing was like shortly after we met, my first full-length album came out and he just wrote this really, really nice email to congratulate him at the album and what he thought of it track by track. And I was like, that's such an interesting thing to do. Like who actually takes the time to go through your album and let you know how he personally feels about your music. How fresh it is, this kind of thing, this and yeah, yeah. You know, we started Skyping back and forth and yeah, it was really only a matter of time before uh, she asked if I wanted to do music with her. Initially, I was kind of hesitant about it because I'm kind of a loner in that sense and just like to do everything by myself. And maybe it was also a bit of uh, insecurity, you know, about showing what you can do, but she persisted and uh, that's what we did. Yeah. I learned a lot from Martijn because he samples a lot. I'm a gear freak, so we're really opposite. And it was really nice to see how he approaches music and how I approach music. And also style-wise, because of the drum and bass background and the UK background. 
When Matijn released his first album, definitely dubstep was a new uh, genre and they were very much on top of the game. I think after this first album, I started getting a lot busier, lots of DJing and, you know, a lot of people started to align themselves with me and I started to align myself with them. I think I was on a lot of people's lips at that time, so it was really a good time and a sort of time to really enjoy, I think. But I also saw that having a career and also having that sort of personality in your music is very difficult sometimes because more people get involved in your career, you know, you have managers and you have an agent and you have lots of people that have a sort of an influence on you. If I hear you play a DJ set, I can always tell kind of just by listening that there is a kind of flow and you kind of let go. And suddenly there's like a kind of rationality coming back. And you, you know, for me, that's a very interesting play to, to hear because of obviously in a DJ set, it's much more uh, adaptive. Yeah. in the moment. And for me, it's always interesting to, to hear if you hit play like, for instance, like a longer set, like a panorama bar set or something, it's a couple of hours. I can almost hear like how you think or how you let go, you know? Yeah, yeah. And this, yeah. this friction is constantly going on. And I think it's, yeah. it's a very personal approach, of course, but I think it's also a very interesting struggle. Like, you yeah. know, if you have to produce an album, this, this mechanism continues. The sort of bigger you get, the, the harder it becomes to stay true to your own person, you know? I think a lot of my music between maybe 2011 and 2014, 15 had to do with that, you know? That sort of always sort of on the brink of, okay, is this still, you know, my personal music and my journal like it was in the beginning? Or is this like a, a career move? Obviously, it's always a little bit of both, and that's not bad, but you always have to sort of be happy with that balance. Sometimes I was, and sometimes I wasn't, I think, and that's really been a little bit of a struggle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So much so that I think I started to retreat a little bit from this sort of DJ life and artist life. Yeah. When we were doing this, you know, nothing mattered. You know, you would do graffiti and I would just play some tunes and everything was cool because yeah. we were just having fun and it's yeah. enthusiastic. Yeah. But you know, now we're like six albums later, yeah. um, you know, yeah. with like, you know, traveled a lot and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden that does take a toll. It's much harder to sort of break away from all that other stuff and just literally, literally go like, okay, yeah. let's just make a banger, you know, yeah. let's make a tune and just yeah. have fun. and. Yeah hope that someone plays it, you yeah. know? And, yeah. Um, yeah. But I think, yeah, I think now I kind of found out how to sort of rekindle that a little bit and, yeah. and still have the sort of enjoyment of making music, you know? Yeah. It was um, late June 2017. I was sort of um, making sketches and stuff for a new project, just sort of, you know, the way I usually do. This was that day that I guess I knew maybe would come sometime. I was just sitting here and blacked out and just found myself waking up on the floor. Our two cats were sort of sitting in front of me and thinking what happened to our human. My heart just completely stopped. The sort of pacemaker that I have sensed that something was wrong and that the whole heart just had quit. It just sort of jolts you back. Yeah. 
Come on, let's go up the hill. We're gonna walk. You wanna come walk? Uh -huh. Hmm. Okay. Ready? It's, it's it's our turn now. Almost. Almost our turn. Yeah. We can go now. Like that. I'm so sweaty. I know. I've been walking around so much today. Yeah, don't worry. Maybe <clears> when we get home. When you know you sort of realize what actually happened, you also realize what you could have lost. Peetje. <laughs> I think that makes it even more important to sort of put all your energy that you have in the right things and not in things that aren't really that important, you know? Ah! <laughs> you play this. Okay, play. That's definitely something that I try to do every day, whether it be with Faye or with Ali or with you know any of my friends or my music. You know, that's just okay. my life and that's yeah. where all my energy is supposed to go. Even like a wooden snowman. What? You have stories today, Livia. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Lots of stories. I have a grandpa too. Yeah, I know. I'm very tired. Me too. Ugh. Let's go inside. Her name is Anna. It changed a lot of his perspective about his sensitivity, the way he saw life and, you know, had to come out of this whole thing and get back on the road. It's like a brother-sister talk, like, are you sure you want to do this? Up until the point where he's like, hey, listen, I'm going to go back into the studio and I need to process this into an album. when I sort of got back into my groove and I was actually able to go in the same studio again and try and put all that aside and start making music again. It was pretty clear that I had to also musically go back to where I came from. Time is limited and I have stuff to leave behind, you know, so you want to make things and you want to produce things that will be there when you are gone. It's strange. It's like you have this energy to want to do new things and to want to do more, like make more music. And, you know, I'm working on a book at the moment. At the same time, living life is a bit slower now, you know, and it feels better that way because, you know, you have more presence of mind and, you know, you're happier and you actually have time to enjoy it. Any requests? The same one. The same one. What about this? <laughs> 